Redstone Castle is a mansion that was built by John Cleveland Osgood in the early 1900s. The castle today is one of the most important buildings in Colorado. A lot of it is unique because of its location. It's really pretty remote and it certainly would have been at 1900. The place is famous throughout the state and it's a precious place to us. It is the basis for Redstone's being here. Osgood developed the coking and coal industry. This was built to entertain and show his wealth and significance to the world. It tells the story of innovation, of industry. So Redstone Castle is where so much of it began. This program was made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. Many forces drew Americans westward after the Civil War. There's a whole movement to reconstruct the South, but there's also a vision of how the West might be reconfigured and reshaped in ways that would be more beneficial to the nation and to individuals. There's lots of good reasons to come to the West after the Civil War. There's lots of good reasons not to come. Indian presence, rights, powers are very unsettled, and it's a dangerous era. While most people risking the move to Colorado were mining for gold and silver, Osgood recognized an untapped resource, coal. Through it, he would build an empire and would become the fuel king of the West. Osgood viewed himself as maybe not above the law, but he said uh, men of wealth should really have more than one vote. They knew how to build a nation. They knew what was best for their workers, and they knew better than the government or anyone else how to run their business. Well, looking back into history, the robber barons certainly didn't call themselves that, but they did feel as though they were the American aristocracy and also that they knew not only better what was good for the workers, but what was good for the government and for America. John C. Osgood was born in New York in 1851. He came from some really strong family roots, Puritans from England. However, by the time he's nine years old, he's orphaned. Both of his parents have died. And he and his other siblings, it said, were doled out to different relatives. John raised by his Quaker relatives in Rhode Island, puts himself through boarding school, and attends the Peter Cooper Institute, which was like a poor man's Harvard. He graduated with an accounting degree at the age of 19, and he always said that he wanted to present the impression that he was very driven. He would not drink because he wanted to make an impression on his employers. He saved a lot of money. He helped his siblings with cash and other opportunities. He then, by 1874, became the cashier of the First National Bank in Burlington, Iowa. Four years later, in 1878, he managed to buy the bankrupt Whitebreast Coal and Mining Company, and then his Colorado venture would start after that. And there was actually some miners who, because of an avalanche, saw a coal seam and didn't think it had much value at all, so they sold it to John Osgood for some very small amount, and it turned into this huge empire enterprise. He was a brilliant, businessman. He surrounded himself with some of the best officials, associates around, and they worked together to establish the largest coal industry in the West, not only in Colorado, but in the West. Osgood would solidify his empire by creating the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, CF&I, which was heavily sustained by a product called Coke. 
Coke was the industrial fuel for smelters and steel mills created by purifying coal in sealed ovens. Osgood's Coke ovens operated 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. While this relentless production was profitable to him, it was a terrible strain on his workers. The workers were treated horribly and the coal barons, like Osgood, did not follow the law. They just simply believed that they were above the law. In many of the coal camps, almost all of the workers who were brought in from the 1880s on into the early years of the 20th century were immigrant. Most of them could not read or write, and they became virtual slaves. Many of them were forced to build their own houses, the shacks. They built shacks out of whatever material they could find, old scrap, sheet metal, and old lumber that was around. And they used buckets stacked upon one another for stove pipes. The conditions were horrible. The men, of course, eventually want to unionize. I mean, these men are making $3 a day on coal that they've mined, and they're getting paid on just the tonnage, the coal after it's been processed in the coke ovens. So there were some really unfair practices. Osgood refused to let any union organizer set foot near his properties and paid his men in scrip, currency only usable at his company store. But after a labor strike in 1901, the public became aware of the horrendous conditions miners endured. Facing public outcry, Osgood changed his management style to a social experiment called welfare capitalism. Osgood decided to build the village of Redstone as a model village to demonstrate his new industrial betterment policy. At that time, he was a businessman and he was interested in the, the bottom line, the dollar. He accepted the fact that workers would be more productive if they had good living conditions, good working conditions, and that it was the responsibility of the corporation to provide good housing, good sanitation, recreation for the miners. Here at Redstone, with the assistance of his sociologist, Dr. Richard Corwin, they implemented this industrial and sociological experiment to see if providing a better life for the worker and his family, that if they couldn't improve their living situations, the men would be less likely to join a union or to want to strike or to migrate on. And Dr. Richard Corwin, full of ideals, talking wonderfully about the needs of the workers. He responds to public health problems, to the sufferings of disease. He tries to get better sanitation. I mean, there's, there's some stuff of real engagement with the problems of workers. Originally, the men that built the coke ovens and then worked at them lived in tents behind the ovens. And then about 1899, they would have started building the houses, that, some of which you still see today in Redstone. They hired the architects and designed them each individually with superintendent's houses. The Redstone Inn served as a lodge for the single workers, men who didn't need to rent a whole house. Redstone then also had a fire station. It had a school, a really beautiful brick building school and a three-story clubhouse with a 200-person seat auditorium where Osgood brought in theater and opera productions. So the motives are to create a better workforce for the immediate future. This wasn't just Redstone. The other camps had kindergartens and they had education programs as well, but Redstone was really the top piece. A mile above his model town, Osgood would build his castle and it would later be known as the Jewel of the Rockies. It had a number of names. It was Cleveholm Manor, it was Osgood Castle, and then Redstone Castle. I think after he left, it kind of became the kind of catch-all name. The castle was started in 1899, just as the rest of the village, and was finished by December of 1902. And it had electricity, and it became the country estate, then the manor house, of the Osgoods by 1902. Redstone Castle has a lot of the character of the valley. The stone came from right across the Crystal River, and so that forms the base. And then above that, the building rises out of the site and has this majestic command of the front lawn. Three stories on the front side of the house give you a really great sense of how 
important that structure is in the valley. It starts out with that Richardsonian Romanesque base, all that heavy stone rusticated, and then it grows up much lighter with wood framing and Tudor accents and tower accents and shingles. A firm by the name of Bowl and Harnoy, architects in Denver, were hired by Osgood to design his castle. There's a little bit of debate as to which one of them actually designed it because Bowl was kind of the guy who went around and had all the contacts. Supposedly Harnoy was the guy who did most of the work. There are many iconic rooms in the mansion. The most notable is the Great Room, which has ceilings somewhere in the range of 19 or 20 feet. Gorgeous fireplace with Osgood's crest on it. There's a gorgeous library with dyed green leather walls, and it's got an aluminum leaf ceiling. We thought for many years it was gold leaf, but it was tested and it's aluminum, but that was far more valuable at the turn of the century. The music room is a French statement with gilded leaf mirrors that are made from diamond dust. The dining room is more of a Russian statement and Russian ruby red velvet wall cover. It's Honduran mahogany and another one of the aluminum gold leaf looking like ceilings. The light fixtures in the mansion were designed by Louis Tiffany and Company of New York specifically for the mansion. When we bought the castle, two of them were in the garage in pieces. April ran across them, we took them to a lamp remanufacturer in Denver and he was able to remanufacture them and our electrician was able to get them back up. You can definitely tell the difference between the new and the old in that the old ones are massive in terms of weight. You just pick them up and you know that you've got something of value. There was a hydroelectric plant installed just upstream here. A small remnant of it still exists. So it did have electricity at 1900 when half of Denver and New York don't. One of the most spectacular features of the castle, in my opinion, are the architectural ceilings in the upper level rooms. They're referred to as balloon ceilings that give them the sensation of an elevated ceiling. They're about 10 feet high. The normal bedroom nowadays is about eight foot high ceilings, which just make the rooms feel more expansive and bigger. And they're rounded around the edges. They just had to take a tremendous amount of work to be able to get them constructed that way, especially in 1900. Redstone Castle was designed for entertaining from the billiards room in the basement with the walnut billiards table that probably weighs 4,000 pounds to the heads mounted from all their wonderful big game hunting, which was very manly. Many notable industrialists, they would come out and stay in Redstone for entertainment, to smoke cigars and shoot pool and conspire their next moves in the industry. One of the reasons Osgood built the place was to entertain his peers, and his peers happened to be J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Gould, Prince Leopold of Belgium was apparently documented to have been here. I think a lot of business was done behind closed doors here. One of the guest rooms was entitled the Roosevelt Suite. Another one is called the Morgan Suite. Each of the guest rooms have their own fireplaces. There's 14 fireplaces in the mansion each with their own tile or marble that was imported at the time. The thing that's unusual to me about rubbing elbows with these kinds of people is we're pretty far from Denver. We're pretty far from any large cities at all. And of all the places in the world John Osgood could have lived, he chose to live here because it's a beautiful valley. And this is the place he wanted to show off to his guests. The coal miners didn't build houses like this. We believe it was mostly Austrian stonemasons, as well as a lot of Italian metal workers. Two of the rooms in particular inside the building, the library and the music room, had artisans come imported over from Europe just to do the work in these rooms. The mansion itself is 42 rooms. We actually have 10 rooms that are under historic easement, which means we can't change any of the permanent fixtures or layout or anything like that. But we knew that going into it, and Steve and I said, we would never change those rooms. It's what they were, it's what they need to be. Several of those rooms have either original stenciling. We're in the music room now. It has original damask silk type wallpaper. The dining room has red velvet on the walls. 
Much of it is stenciling. It's actually stenciled with a pineapple pattern, which is a symbol of hospitality. A lot of the furnishings date back even to the Osgoods. The sun porch was an addition put on in 1903. We've never seen the original plans to know if it was an afterthought or always planned to be a part of the building, but it certainly afforded them a beautiful view year round of the sweeping lawns and all of the estate. He probably even had a pretty good view of the workings of the coke ovens. There are marble fireplaces and marble furnishings throughout the home. Even though Osgood owned a marble quarry, they weren't developing the white marble here. So everything throughout the house is a European, mainly Italian marble, and all that was brought in. At the time, Italian marble was the best marble in the world, and that's why Osgood, who spared no expense at furnishing and building Cleve Home, would have had Italian marble in the house. Today, we know that the Italians have bought the marble quarry 12 miles away because the best marble in the world comes from marble. Colorado. Osgood's castle stood as a monument to his success and fortune, but he would not enjoy it for long. One of the problems that Osgood faced was that although he had a lot of money, he didn't have enough to accomplish what he wanted to do. He overextended himself. Facing financial difficulty, Osgood attempted to borrow money from John D. Rockefeller, but Rockefeller wanted control of Colorado Fuel and Iron, and Osgood agreed. Osgood maintained ownership of the village and his castle, as they were part of his personal estate. But the market for coal and coke was disappearing. The coal basin mine closed in 1909, and Redstone became a ghost town. Cleveland Manor and the other estate buildings were literally mothballed. By 1911, Osgood left pretty much for good. He had no desire to leave Cleveland, and he loved it. He referred to it as his beloved residence, but he didn't spend much time here after 1911. When he returned in 1924, he returned to stay here and to die here. And in 1924, after marrying for the third time, he'll return here and spend another million dollars refurbishing the house. They wanted to restore Redstone and make it into a resort. And so they opened up the castle again. They renovated the infrastructure of Redstone and opened up some of the cottages, began to think in terms of a mountain resort. Osgood was already very sick. He had developed a stomach cancer by then. And it was interesting that he chose this place to be. It would have been very far from any kind of care that you could have gotten at his own hospital in Pueblo or in Denver. But he chose to be here and died here in 1926 at the age of 75. When Osgood died, he left a property to his third wife, Lucille. He was in his 70s, she was in her late 20s. And she had a huge burden to take care of. It wasn't only the castle, it was also the inn and the whole town of Redstone were her responsibility. That was in 1926. Of course, the stock market crashed in 1929. Lucille would pretty much leave Redstone in the early 1930s. It was hard to keep the estate going and the village going, particularly with the Depression. Lucille then would sell Cleve Home in the 1940s. Redstone Castle went into this sort of holding pattern because what do you do with a building like that? There's not too many people that actually fit the mold that can live in a building of that stature. The Redstone Castle would change hands many times, with each owner attempting to revitalize the landmark estate, each owner falling short. With every failed attempt, the survival of the castle was in danger. Ken Johnson, who was publisher of the uh, Grand Junction Sentinel, with uh, the support of Pitkin County, put the building on the National Register of Historic Places. So that was one of the first steps in preserving it. What many people don't know is that the National Register has no teeth. It's this wonderful list of historic properties, but it doesn't bring with it any legal teeth until the federal government gets involved. The castle has been threatened several times, but a major threat was in about 1974. After a development contract fell through, the castle was deemed too costly to repair, and talks of demolition began to circulate. 
it was at the nick of time that Ken Johnson bought the castle to save it. Before any federal protections were in place, a man named Leon Hart and a group of investors bought the Redstone Castle, but it was seized by the IRS and the Securities Exchange Commission after it was discovered to be part of a nationwide Ponzi scheme. This put the fate of the castle in jeopardy once again. They had plans of dismantling it and selling it off in pieces. A couple of significant members of the community, Peter Martin, a retired attorney, Daryl Munsell, retired college professor, went after the SEC and the Internal Revenue Service. At that time, we were concerned that it be preserved, and there was talk that they didn't have to preserve anything because they were the federal government. I filed a motion to intervene in their federal foreclosure action, and I argued that Castle was subject to the preservation statutes. And after considerable argument, it was agreed that they would comply with the National Historic Preservation Act. The Redstone Castle today is one of the very few buildings in Colorado that has a conservation easement, both interior and exterior conservation easement. We consider the placing of the easements on the building as a major accomplishment. It took a lot of effort with the support of the National Trust, Colorado Preservation Inc., Colorado History, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Without their help, I don't think a small historic society would have accomplished this, so we have to give them a great deal of credit for that. My husband and I and our daughters used to drive by the castle quite often because we had a cabin passed here. And it was always so fascinating. I think everyone dreams a little, wow, what would it be like to live there, to stay there? And then as time went by, the castle diminished in value. It was sold in 2000 for $6 million. 2005, it sold for $4 million. And we bought it for $2 million, which basically shows the decline of the property when it wasn't used. When we purchased the castle, the biggest concern was the speed at which it was deteriorating. And we knew we had to get seriously and quickly get a lot done. And we did. <laughs> the night after we bought it, we sat down with the architect and put a plan on a napkin. And probably 90% of that plan came through. We had been working with the Carvers on their Hotel Denver in Glenwood. And I got a call, Nan, Steve Carver's on the phone. Guess what we just did? No idea, Steve, how are you? Well, we just bought Redstone Castle. And I said, you are crazy. I think a lot of the owners realized they'd bitten off more than they could chew. And so there was a lot of slapstick preservation. Theories around preservation have changed throughout the years. And that's also reflected in the Redstone Castle and how they handled certain things. We went into it with ambitions of just kind of cleaning it up and making things more usable for the current day. But as we got into it, we decided basically to finish the entire interior. We've touched every wall, every ceiling, and every floor in the castle and it's beautiful. I say it looks the best it has since the day it opened. The Carvers found some really excellent craftsmen, some with our help, to restore some of the finishes in the building because when you talk about embossed leather, when you talk about Tiffany lampshades, those are the features that you don't find in every house in Colorado for sure. So we really had to draw on the national stable of experts to do some of the work at the castle. We've had restoration folks from the State Historic Fund show up that had experience in New York and so on. He sent us an email later that said, this is one of the most respectful reuses of a historic property I've ever seen. So we're very proud of it. It is very important to preserve and maintain this building. If we've heard the expression, if walls could talk, there are so many stories surrounding this castle from questionable marriages and divorces, to robber barons, to immigrant stories. The legacy of the castle, the thing that needs to be passed on to the next generation, is it's a place to tell the stories and make the stories come alive. And there are a great number of stories. Why is it important to save the Redstone Castle? There's so much context there, from the social to the economic to architectural, and everything about the architecture up there captures this message that Osgood was kind of desperate to tell and to share with the rest of the country. The castle today 
is one of the most important buildings in Colorado. It, along with the village, reflects a period of history that I don't think can be understood without the physical evidence. It was a period of the industrialization of Colorado. And to have people come in and visit the place, they can understand how the industrialization of the West was accomplished. Without this physical evidence, you go to a history book and you can get some information from a history book, but you don't get the feeling. You don't get the spirit. Occasionally we're approached by friends and relatives and even our daughters as to why are you guys doing this? And my classic response is that I just have this vision of how beautiful it's going to be whenever we get done. And so far it has not surprised me wrongly. It's been everything I expected and then some. It's just a beautiful place to be.